Bill Black has been entertaining audiences for over 50 years. Founder of AC Comics, one of the longest running independent publishers around, he has created such characters as Femforce and the Scarlet Scorpion. As a filmmaker under Night Vale Media, he has made several films based on his comic characters. A lifelong fan of monster movies, Bill has also made several retro-style monster and sci-fi films. Bill Black was born on September 14, 1943, to parents John and Gail Schwartz. As a child, he grew up in the town of Tarentum, Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, from an early age, he developed his love for comics and movies. I developed an interest in comics, uh, I guess around age six. Uh, I lived in a uh, small steel town in uh, Pennsylvania called Tarentum, which was 20 miles east of Pittsburgh. And in that environment, all of us kids collected comic books. We always uh, went to the newsstand. You know, we knew when the new comics would come out and we were always there and it was just part of our life. Uh, before cosplay, we uh, dressed up as our uh, favorite comic book heroes, and we had a kind of a ritual where uh, every Saturday we'd get our allowance, and then we would go to the movies and see, um, like you see pictured here, like Roy Rogers and uh, various cowboy movies, and they'd run a serial, and um, then afterwards, I don't know what they did, but I always went to the newsstand, and... Um, would see what the latest comic books were that, that came in. So I'd say I started actively collecting comics at age six. And I mean, I did collect them. I never threw them out. Uh, my parents would have loved for me to throw them out. Uh, it meant a lot to us, but it didn't mean so much to the adults. Yet I'll have to say every household I went into, except for my great uncle, uh, every household in that town had comic books in it. In addition to reading and collecting comics, Bill started to take an interest in art and drawing. I started my art career in the second grade when there was a little girl that I thought was very beautiful. Her name was Karen Love. How's that? Huh? She drew horses. So in order to get in good with her, I tried drawing, of course, horses way beyond. But that was the, my first attempt at uh, comics, but I never thought of it or, or art as a career. Uh, later on, after I'd moved to Florida and I was in the sixth grade, I, I got in a, a drawing competition with my fellow classmates, a, a guy, I'm not making this up, his name was Bobby Hunkapiller. He was from Louisiana, and he would draw period pirate stories and make them as comic books. So I started drawing my own comic books. His was LA Comics for Louisiana, and mine was PA because I was in Pennsylvania. And my first comic book character that I drew was again a time from the movies was the Black Commando. And they had re-released the 1942 Columbia serial, The Secret Code, in the early 50s. And I saw that in the theaters and that starred a masked character called the Black Commando. And he was the first comic book character that I ever drew. And that started me on my drawing career. And the reason I continued drawing after that competition in the sixth grade was as comics uh, were canceled, uh, I would try to draw my own version to keep it going. Bill and his family relocated to Central Florida in 1951, landing in Winter Park. Bill found the comic and movie scene in Florida to be much different from his former home of Pennsylvania. Eventually, Bill was able to find someone that shared his interests, and this opened up new opportunities. Up north, everybody was into comics and went to the movies. Down, down When I moved to Winter Park, uh, I was a mile and a half and away, away from the nearest movie theater, whereas in Pennsylvania I could walk to it. So it was an ordeal, but it was a ritual I did every week. And uh, there were a lot of us that went to the, the, the theater in Winter Park. They would have yo-yo contests and stuff like that, so some of my classmates would gather to, to that. But I was the only one that, when the monster movie craze came, I was the only one that went to those. And I would have to then take a bus from Winter Park into Orlando to see those movies downtown. From the third grade to the twelfth grade, I only met one other guy that actively collected comic books like I did. And one day I was uh, in art class, I would have been, I guess, in my senior year. And this transfer student comes in, he transferred down from Washington, uh, D.C. And he walks into the class and he has a folded up copy of Famous Monsters of Filmland in his back pocket. So I said, 
Brother Rat. I mean, I mean, even more obscure than liking comic books, it was obscure to like monster movies. So his name was Jim Cacavo, and he was a fellow artist, and his father was actually a cinematographer in the Air Force, and there was Orlando Air Force Base, and that's why he moved to Winter Park. Uh, so he had uh, interest in filmmaking and interest in comics. And uh, we worked together usually with him in front of the camera and me behind the camera, although sometimes we were both in front of the camera. Motivated by his love for monster movies and knowing a few like-minded people, Bill acquired a camera and began to work on making films. When I was in high school, uh, I, I got a, um, a used 8mm movie camera. I never had in my entire life to this day had two nickels rubbed together. So um, home movies was a, was a popular thing uh, in families. Everybody had a home movie camera. My family didn't. So I went to a, a, a camera store in Winter Park and found a used camera that was within my price range. And I wanted to make black and white movies because the movies I would see in the theater, the monster movies are all in black and white. There are very few that were ever done in color. So I want to emulate that. So I, you couldn't buy black and white film locally. You had to mail order it. With the ability to shoot movies in black and white the way he envisioned it, Bill started the process of making his first movie. I think the first one was um, Invasion of the Bargain. And, and I made a, a monster head out of um, paper mache and he, he kind of looked like the monsters in uh i married a monster from outer space that Im impressed me that it was probably neat makeup on that but it, it wasn't like applied to his face it was a, a headpiece that went over his head and um uh, i guess my mother helped me we made a black bodysuit for him and, and we shot that and we got a, a couple of girls that we thought were hot from my you know high school class and we filmed a couple scenes. Then we sent the film off to get it processed, and when it comes back, it's just worthless. It's terrible. It's all either overexposed or underexposed. It's, it's worthless, so we had to give up on doing the black and white stuff. Always looking for new innovations to his filmmaking, Bill worked to improve the look of his monsters. This led to a pleasant surprise. I really love monster movies. Monster movies were my life, and the only connection I had with monster movies was uh, Forrest J. Ackerman's magazine, Famous Monsters of Filmland. And he was running a contest in Famous Monsters. If you uh, make up your own monster, and uh, if you become a finalist and are the winner, you get to play a part in an American international horror movie, which at this time would have been a Vincent Price movie. Wow, what an incentive that was. So I didn't want to do a traditional monster. I wanted to do something uh, unique. And also I was already making my own amateur movies at the time. So we, we made this movie, or I made the, the monster for this movie, um, The Creature from Galaxy 27. And uh, he was um, a humanoid monster, but his head was all wacky. It was like orange and he had thin ears and he had a single eye in the middle, which was made from a, an egg, you know, you. You knock a hole in an egg and you flow the yolk out of it and then you let it dry out and then you paint an, uh, an iris and pupil on it and put it in the head. He had an eye. And uh, I wanted to make him different than humans. So I had the socket of the eye had hair in it and then the mouth had hair in it and he had, you know, fangs up and down in it. So that was Solopticus. I uh, had to have a name for him for the magazine, so we called him Solopticus and we never used the name in the movie. So I took pictures of Solopticus and sent it in. And lo and behold, I became one of the 10 finalists. I didn't win, but I was there with like nine other guys. And in Famous Monsters number 18, they, they got a picture of me and a picture of the monster. Being a low budget filmmaker, Bill had to find creative ways to add special effects to his films. How I did my effects were, uh, I was very fascinated by miniature sets. And so I, I built uh, as many as I as I could muster, uh, and I um, my parents were long suffering uh, to emulate a, a cave. I would get butcher paper, which was brown, and I'd wad it all up so it had different angles in it. Then I would masking tape it to the walls in my house, and then I would put the camera on a tripod at the other end of the corridor and turn it on, and then I would go down to the other end and walk through the scene. So that was one version of a, of a, a practical set. And then I, I built a, a really tiny little uh, spaceship cockpit on my carport 
where we just took a, a piece of masonite and spray painted it silver and I got some old radio tubes and stuff and made a little view screen and that was the Vargan spaceship. Bill continued making movies throughout high school, deriving inspiration for scripts from movies of the era. Uh, the ideas of the movies would almost always center around the monster. I, I, I like to make monsters and we'd make a monster then I'd come up with a story around that. And I knew my uh, limitations, so uh, it would always involve high school kids, pretty much. Right? Creature from the Galaxy 27, Kakavo and I, although we were in high school, we were supposedly our government agents in that. And we got my dad to be in it, so we would have a contrast of you know, someone older. But um, most of the other movies dealt with, um, I suppose it would be um, inspired by the blob, the Blob was made in 58, and Steve McQueen was playing a high school student in that, even though he was in his 20s. But I always thought that was a, a good example of um, how teenagers should act. The movies that I made, uh, it would be like uh, a spaceship would land, and the monster would come out, or a meteor would crash, and the monster would come out. Somehow we'd get the monster out, and he would be attacking Winter Park shooting down death rays and blowing up the colony movie theater and, and stuff like that. Um, but it always, always centered around the, uh, the monsters and I, I would handwrite the scripts. Ready to get back to filmmaking, Bill started production on his movie Black Mass. Cacavo uh, was a, c a Catholic and uh, we wanted to uh, point out uh, the ludicrousness of the Catholic Church, okay? And uh, the, so he was all for that. So he played the priest in the movie and he made the call up and wore the black suit and all that. And uh, I forgot who I played, but I, I was the guy whose girlfriend was kidnapped by the cultists and they were going to sacrifice her in a black mass ceremony. And that ceremony would be the cutting out of her, of her heart. And, um, we were at, I was going to Orlando Junior College at that time, and um, there was a, a character there, uh, a student, a fellow student. He was 15 years older than me, so he was like in midlife going back to school. And he was this weasley little, I guess you'd call him a rat-faced like guy. He had a, he had a, a, a close crop goatee, and he had teeth almost kind of like a rat, right? And we thought, God, this guy would be great as the villain in our Black Mass movie. He can be the, the head cult leader. And so we, we, uh, we talked him into it, and he was all for it. He was a real nervous kind of a guy. And uh, it turns out he was an artist, he was a really fantastic artist. And he, he did paintings in miniature that were just breathtaking. Uh, and he did work for me later on when I started Paragon Publications. He did some illustrations. But this was our first experience with F. Stuart Smith, okay? So we, we make this movie. And um, what he did while we were filming the scene ruined the plot of the movie and destroyed forever my relationship with my girlfriend. And that's all I'm going to say about it. OK. And the, the, the sad, cruel thing about this is that I, uh, I lost Kathy, but I gained F. Stewart Smith as kind of a lifelong friend. Uh, so uh, we had to change the ending of that movie and it became a very pessimistic movie and that good didn't triumph over evil, evil didn't triumph over good. Everybody dies at the end of this movie, everybody, everybody dies. So uh, Kathy didn't get saved, she got her heart cut out and, and my heart was cut out too. <laughs> After finishing high school, Bill took the next step and signed up to attend college at Florida State University. Um, I went to FSU because it was recommended to me by my high school art teacher, who uh, it was Mrs. Winslow, and she also lived down the street from me in uh, on the same street I lived on in Winter Park. So I knew her all, all my life in Florida, and I respected her. And um, she said that uh, Florida State was a good school for art. Uh, University of Florida, Central Florida, didn't exist then, and the only other choice was University of Florida. Because at the time there was no film school at Florida State, Bill was free to do the type of movies he wanted. I, I got to do a lot of movies at Florida State on my own because there was no film school there. And also I, I did a lot in art uh, because I, I got up with a uh, renegade magazine publisher uh, who I met at, at uh, 
off campus at, at Florida State. With the help of a local renegade independent magazine publisher, Bill had an outlet for his artistic talents and ambition. Every university or college has the, their own magazine, and it's usually a humor magazine where they make fun of the administration. They had one at, at Florida State, and I can't even remember the name of it now, but of course, the, you're under the auspices of the uh, faculty, and you can't get too outrageous or they bring the ax down on you. Uh, the Charlatan was a renegade college humor magazine that was published and edited by uh, Bill Killeen, who was a former student at the University of Texas. And at the University of Texas, he and a cartoonist named Gilbert Shelton created a character for the U of T magazine called Wonder Warthog. Wonder Warthog has gone on to become very famous. And, uh, but at this time, this was the beginning of Wonder Warthog. So it was Wonder Warthog, which was a parody of a superhero, which was a comic strip, which got me interested in the charlatan, which got me up with Killeen. Now he would set up little card tables in front of like the bookstore across the street from the university. He wasn't allowed physically on the campus, but he could set up across the street at the sweet shop or the bookstore and he would peddle his magazines. He'd have a big stack of them and they were 50 cents a piece back then. Okay, so I explained to him who I was and that I was a cartoonist and all this kind of stuff and I asked if he needed art. Mostly he was getting art by cutting cartoons out of other magazines and pasting them up. So um, I came to work for him as a cartoonist and eventually became the associate editor. And um, we had a lot of adventures with the charlatan, which was um, not limited by any faculty administration whatsoever and we did we were able to become popular by putting down dean hale at the university of florida and all the florida state deans and all that. anything that the kids hated we would put in there and they'd love it and they'd buy the magazine and we sold ads to the local businesses the pizza joints and all that and i would do illustrations for the ads that would go in the magazine and i would did some of the covers I never got to do a Wonder Warthog strip, but I did get to draw him on the cover. While working for the charlatan, Bill became a part of history and controversy as the magazine set out to try something that had not been done before. Also, in uh, the, the, the thing that gave the charlatan, uh, okay, every year there would be a, uh, a voting on what's the best college humor magazine in America. And for a couple years in a row, even though it was not associated with an actual university or college, the charlatan won. And we got to have the tagline, America's number one humor magazine that was under, under the masthead in the book. Also, all these magazines would have a pinup girl in it and they would get some co-ed at whatever university and they'd photograph her in a skimpy outfit or a bathing suit. And, uh, and since we couldn't call her the girl of the month like Playboy, because it came out irregularly, she was called the feature girl. So uh, there was a uh, sense of propriety in that there was no nudity and that there had never been any nudity in any college humor magazine. So of course, Killeen had to be strike out against the world to have the first naked co-ed centerfold in a college humor magazine. And this young lady's name was Pam Brewer and she had all the necessary equipment and she was uh, quite nice looking. and. Uh, she became the feature girl in an issue of Charlatan. And when it came out that she was laid out in the middle, completely naked, uh, this got on the news everywhere. I mean, not just in Tallahassee, everywhere, all around the country, maybe even around the world. While at Florida State, Bill and a friend came up with a script for Carnage of Dracula. Bill, wanting to change the look of his movie, decided to shoot it in a different format. I had been shooting movies in 8mm and the goal would be someday to be able to do a sound movie and you have to go to 16mm. It's a very complicated and expensive system unlike today's telephone or, or cell phone or camcorder where everything is combined into one unit. You had to have all kinds of ancillary equipment to do a sound movie. But um, I, I wanted to see if I could, uh, I, I had a movie coming up, I wanted to do a director the movie. I was living off campus uh, and one of my roommates was an actor or professed to be an actor and he uh, wanted to be Dracula and he 
had his own Dracula cape and his fangs and everything. So we uh, went together and decided we were going to write a script and he wrote most of it and we were going to do a movie which we came to call Carnage of Dracula. And I wanted to try to shoot, the, shoot this in 16 millimeter. And uh, I know that uh, sporting events at, at Florida State were filmed in 16 millimeter because there was no camcorders back in those, in those days. So I found out who the man was that did this at Florida State and I went to his office uh, to talk to him about the possibility of borrowing a camera to shoot my monster movies. While trying to gain permission to shoot the film on campus, Bill found himself in a heated confrontation with one of the members of the faculty. The only thing I knew about this guy was that he was a German uh, immigrant who had become an American citizen. But it was rumored that he had been a Luftwaffe pilot during World War II. And in the last days of the war, Hitler was putting teenagers in cockpits, you know, because they were running out of men. So it's possible that this guy was that. But anyways, when I uh, approached him on the subject, he blew his top. He literally hit the ceiling and he started ranting and raving and cussing and swearing and shaking his fist at me. Under no circumstances would anybody film any movies at Florida State University except him. He was the only man who was authorized to do it. No one would ever do it. No one can ever shoot any film on this campus except me. And he was dropping the F-bomb right and left, and I couldn't believe it because this guy was in the administration. Um, and uh, back in those days, you know, even us college guys, we didn't swear all that much. And here it was unheard of that, you know, a person of uh, authority in a university was effing me right and left. And um, I was literally shocked. And he, you know, threw me out of his office. And uh, I, I, I was numb. I just, it was on the second floor of a building. On the inside of the building, it had like an atrium, an open space. And his office was on the second floor and had a balcony on it. And you could look down into the atrium. And I stood out in front of his office. And he slammed the door on me. And I just, it took me a couple of minutes to regain my senses from the assault. Discouraged after the confrontation, Bill found new inspiration and the carnage of Dracula once again took off when he discovered a location right around the corner. And I started looking around this building and you know, the architecture. And this thing must have been built back in the 1920s or earlier than that. And it had uh, this old uh, European architecture. And I thought, well, this would be a great place to film a Dracula movie because the inside of this building looks like it could be Dracula's castle. And so I walked around and I, I, I went, the more I looked, the, the more I saw that I liked. You know, it had some things like cast iron uh, guardrails on the steps, but other than that, it, it, it probably could pass as a, as a Dracula castle. So I made up my mind, I was going to film my Dracula movie in this building. Screw this guy, you know. Uh, I didn't have his camera, but I had my own camera, so we were going to do this. So I would... Uh, would have to do it on the weekend. And so I, I went to the building on Saturday and Sunday to check what was going on in the building. And there was nobody there. And no one ever locked the building. And I would walk up the stairs and go all through the building and I didn't find another living being in the building. So I thought, okay, we can make a go of this. Bill, who at the time was not a student at FSU, decided to move forward with the on-campus location. He and his team got to work putting together a cast and setting up the shoot. So my roommate, Mike, uh, he lined up actors from uh, the Tallahassee Little Theater. And this is the first time I worked with actors who were older than people my own age. We, we had people in their 30s and 40s, the real old people. In it. And um, he lined up a couple of gals. One would be the vampire gal, one would be the victim, and uh, one guy would be the scientist guy. And the one guy would be the boyfriend of the girl going to rescue her who gets a stake driven through his heart. And then Mike, of course, would be... Uh, Dracula, although we didn't use the name Dracula in the movie, he was Baron Lorbach. I was on the trimester system and I was not actually a student at Florida State at the time. So when I was recounting this to myself, I thought how impossible the whole situation was. I was living in Winter Park. That's a four hour drive to Tallahassee. 
up in Tallahassee, my roommate Mike McGowan is gathering up these actors, and we're going to converge on this building. I wish I could remember the name of it uh, to shoot this movie, and it had to be on a Sunday, I guess. So I, I guess I drove four hours. Must have left before dawn or something, and we, we get up there, and we don't know what we're going to find. But the building is unlocked, and we go in, and we go in carrying a coffin, carrying a a uh, fold-up cot to simulate a, a hospital bed, uh, one of those uh, blood plasma stands, you know, with the the hook on it and the uh, the container of blood on that, and the stake uh, to stake people out in the makeup, and we have what a cast of five uh, plus me, who's the uh, director and cameraman, and we had a makeup artist. So all this we go into this building on the Florida State campus. Nobody's there. Nobody sees us. Nobody cares. We must have shot, I would say, eight hours in order to get this done. As the campus was empty on weekends, the shooting of Carnage was a little less risky. Bill and his team started the actual shooting of the film. We had different parts of that building set up as different locations even. So we had the main character, he was out running through um, the exterior of the building, chasing the vampire. The vampire run by and the guy come after him with the stake in his hand. And, and eventually we went into this building and we had to do things like make the vampire girl uh, age. So we had to put the uh, embalmer's wax on her face to make her look all creepy. So that took time. And then we, uh, the main guy, we had to drive the stake through his heart. So we put him in the coffin. We had this fake stake and it was taped to his chest. And we had a, a different shirt where we had a slit in it and the stake sticking out of it. And then we had to put the blood all around and all that. So it was a, a full scale deal. And like I said, we had a makeup guy doing it and we took still shots and shot it all in eight millimeter, which is, is it was quite a production for, for doing it in eight millimeters. It was a, a silly thing. And we had the lights, all the lights. And I try to light it like a hammer movie. So we would have the lights just off to the side of the, of the camera and uh, plug it into the wall of the building. And away we go. So we got away with it. And when it was done, uh, then we went to one of the guy's house and we shot some rear screen stuff um, where we, uh, we had the characters sitting in a Volkswagen and we put a translucent screen over the back windshield and we projected with an eight millimeter projector the scene of driving looking what we see driving from behind a car there that didn't work out very well i think we cut that from the movie but we got all this done like in one day and i guess i drove back to the tallahassee or back to winter park the next day after shooting bill got to work editing the film during a trip back home with his father bill was able to get a little publicity for the movie so um uh, editing it, it came together pretty good and uh, it looked good and uh, because we had real actors in it, it was it was fairly convincing and uh, I, uh, I was proud of it and it was obviously the best movie I'd made uh, to date and uh, like I said, I was off of school that time and I, I put this together and uh, my dad and I took a trip back to our hometown in Pennsylvania where he knew the guys that worked on the, the town newspaper. And he told them about what I was doing, and they wrote a little article about it for the, the school paper. And I, I had with me uh, the negatives that I shot uh, of making of Carnage of Dracula. And his buddy there took him into the, the photo lab of the newspaper, and he printed me up a whole bunch of 8x10 glossies, you know, from the movie. That was really impressive. Through George Odom, Bill was introduced to a producer, Robert Carlson, who seemed more interested in investing money than the film itself. I found out that there was a, a movie producer who had a business in downtown Winter Park. And as it turned out, his name was Robert Carson and he was the father of a guy I had gone to high school with. I didn't know him in high school. He was a um, underclassman. But anyways, that, that was kind of a link. So I, uh, I guess through George Odom, I, I, I made contact with Robert Carson. And I uh, took Carnage of Dracula with my eight millimeter movie projector and I met with him in his uh, just off of Park Avenue office in Winter Park to show him Carnage of Dracula. So Robert Carson and Guy Del Russo sat down and sat through my Carnage of Dracula. And I think more than what they liked about the movie, see, this is running through my head. What if they did this movie? Would I be the director? How would I direct 
cameramen with real cameras and stuff. I don't know anything about this stuff. I mean, I was very unsure of myself. But the fact that I mentioned that the friend of my father's was going to put $20,000 into it, as soon as they heard that, they were my buddies for life, okay? I mean, and so the wheels started turning like, okay, um, uh, a fool and his money are soon parted, and I'm the guy sitting there with the dunce cap on, and they're just licking their chops over the 20 grand I have, and I can see 20 grand being invested in this and never a movie being made, and hey, good luck next time, kid. So uh, it was part I was, I was a coward, and part I, I felt I was being scammed. I, I never went any further with that, but I, I went back and, and finished my uh, career at Florida State and then immediately got drafted after that. But at that time, Carnage of Dracula was my crowning achievement and it almost got made into kind of a real movie if I wasn't being fleeced. Feeling that Carlson was not on the up and up, Bill passed on working with him and returned to Florida State to finish college. Almost immediately following college, Bill's next journey began. Uh, as, as soon as I graduated from Florida State in 1966, I got my papers from Uncle Sam. I had to report for active duty uh, April 19th. And every day between Christmas 66 and April 19th, I tried to figure out a way to get out of it, but I couldn't. And I went. And uh, if you're in the Army, you're you're at the mercy of what the army wants you to do. You don't have any say, particularly when you go in as a buck private. And uh, this is where I noticed that I had acquired something which I've come to call strange luck uh, because circumstances that happened to me during my army career benefited me greatly under overwhelming odds. I mean, 1967 uh, was the absolute peak of the Vietnam War. And it was my fear that I would be uh, sent to Vietnam where I would either have to kill somebody or be killed myself. On April 19, 1967, Bill reported for duty with the U.S. military. Despite efforts to get him to go to officer's training, with a little bit of strange luck, he was given his next assignment. They called me out and I had to go to uh, interview to get my MOS, which is method of service. Every GI is assigned a method of service, which means what you're going to do when you're in the army. Uh, you could be a, a, an auto mechanic, you could be um, a photographer, or, you know, whatever else, a, a clerk, what, what, which is what this guy was. So I got out of the gas chamber to go to this. And they also were always trying to get me, to, because I had a degree, to, to sign up for uh, officer's training school, o OCS. And I wouldn't do that because if you're an officer, you had to serve three years instead of two. And I wasn't going to give up another year of my life. So the guy that's interviewing me, when he finds out I'm an artist, turns out he is an artist. And he's very disgruntled because obviously he's not an artist in the Army. He's working as a clerk. He's interviewing jerks all day long about and assigning them uh, what their fate's going to be for the next two or four years. So he, I guess he took pity on me and he gave me the MOS of an illustrator. Now, this almost never happens that you're actually given a method of service in something that you're good at. While in basic training, Bill found he was not a fan of the drill instructors and found a way to make some extra money doing what he loved. So anyways, during basic training, I did a lot of things that made people mad at me. Uh, of course, if you're known as an artist and there's career military men around you, you're a pansy ass, you know, that won't have anything to do with you. Uh, in the barracks, the guys, when they found out I was an artist, hey, can you draw a picture of my girlfriend? So I, I did this and I, I, you, you're paid something like $75 a month when you start off in the army. So I made a little extra coin by doing sketches of girls, uh, guys' girlfriends. And one guy even had me draw his mother. And uh, this just pissed off the, the drill instructors. They just really hated that. After boot camp, Bill's strange luck continued as he was given his first assignment and then quickly moved somewhere more fitting of his skills. So uh, when, I, when I get out of the uh, basic training in Fort Benning, also in Georgia, I get papers to go to Fort Stewart, which is uh, the Army base that's closest to Florida. 
And at this time, I'm, I'm dating the, the girl who's going to be my future wife, and she's a grad student at Florida State. And it's within driving distance to go visit her in her home in Jacksonville or at Florida State in, in Tallahassee. Um, so um, I report to duty as an illustrator, and they put me in a place called uh, uh, range control. I didn't understand what that was, but there are guys that draw maps. Fort Stewart is this huge area. It's like 50 miles across, and it's where they uh, train for firing cannons and military uh high, uh, big artillery pieces and stuff like that. And they have to have maps and stuff of the ranges. And so that's what they wanted me to do. Well, it, it was an art job, but it was like what you would do in a mechanical drawing class in high school. The guy whose place I was uh, taking, he saw my art and he realized I had abilities that went beyond what they needed there. So he got me transferred to, uh, and this is amazing, this never happens, to uh, a guy who ran training aids on, on post and uh, his name was Mr. King. He was a civilian and he had two other civilian artists working for him. I was the only GI there. And he set me up and I was drawing things for the commanding officer and for different things that needed to be done through uh, training aids, which is real illustrations. I got to do cartoons and uh, drew tanks, you know, stuff like that. While working for training aids, Bill's boss let him use the facilities after hours for his personal artwork. So uh, while I was there, uh, Mr. King, who was a very nice man, took pity on me. And I asked him if, uh, you know, I like to draw when I'm not on duty. Uh, he gave me a key to the place so I could come in at night and I had access to the drawing table and, you know, all the equipment and stuff that was in training aids. And I came in at night and did that. And it was there that I drew like a seven page story that I submitted to uh, Warren Publications to try to get a job uh, when I got out of the Army as um, an artist doing horror stories for Creepy and Eerie magazine, which is, uh, it just started about 64, I think. And um, that actually came to pass. Uh, after I got out of the Army, uh, Bill Parenti, the editor there, hired me there, and that was my first professional job. So again, this is very unusual. While working on training aids, Bill was presented with the opportunity to work for special services. There was an, another sergeant on the base, we'll just call him the Sarge. Um, who was, came to see me all the time and he had me draw stuff. He wanted me to transfer out of training aids, which was a plush position, to go to work for him in special services. Now his special services was not the special services where you jump out of airplanes into combat zones. This was, he had, he did a, playing dances and gigs, ran movies and stuff for the uh, uh, dependents, the, the wives and children of the uh, enlisted people on the base. So he wanted me to come over there to, to do posters. Now, I uh, went over to his facility and I saw what he had and I met a guy there who was a brother rat. He had uh, uh, liquid projectors and strobe lights. And I thought, well, <laughs> the thing I really hate about going into the army in 1967 is that the art world was exploding. Peter Max and you had uh, Haight Ashbury, had all the great poster art for all the rock bands and stuff. It was an artist's dream. Everything was just fabulous. And I was being taken away from that and locked up away from that for two years. One day while Bill was visiting a friend in Jacksonville, he had a chance meeting with the person who would later become his wife. I had a friend who lived on college, the main street that led into the, the university. He was off campus. And I would go to his place to visit him and I would put my bicycle behind the bushes in his front yard so no one would steal the bike. And uh, one day I was doing just that when I met this young lady coming out of the bushes as I was going into the bushes. And this was Rebecca, a very attractive young lady. She was a grad student at the time. And uh, I was immediately attracted to her because in my twisted mind, I said the long dark hair down to her shoulders and I said, you know, she kind of looks like Barbara Steele. Whoa. Uh, so I started talking her up and I, I noticed that uh, she had a big portfolio under her arm. So I thought, wow, she's good looking and she's an artist. And I found out she was uh, a grad student in, uh, at Florida State in uh, interior uh, design. And these were sketches that she did for her design classes. So that's how we met. As Bill was making plans to get married, he was given orders to ship off to Germany. This move would have made him miss his wedding. But once again, his strange luck came into play and he was able to stay stateside. Uh, while I was uh, working at, at, at training aids, 
I got orders cut on me that I was going to Germany. And in the meantime, my romance with my wife, or my wife to be Rebecca, had gotten to the point where we were engaged and we were going to get married in, on June 15th in Jacksonville, Florida. My orders were to, to send me like June 10th to Germany. So I'd, I'd miss my own wedding. So I'm pissing and moaning about that. I didn't want to do that, uh, but I was very glad that, you know, if you're only in for two years and you get sent to Germany, there's no odds that you're going to also be sent after your, your hitch of duty in Germany. There's not going to be enough time left to, to do a tour in Vietnam. So I, my neck was safe from that point on. But I didn't want to do it because I, I, I really wanted to get married. Uh, so in the barracks, I'm in a room with seven other guys, five guys in a room. One of the guys worked in the headquarters company. Uh, P.O.R. and Levy section, and he came up to me one day and he said, I pulled your files that had your orders to go to Germany. I pulled them out of the filing cabinet and took them and dropped them behind the filing cabinet so you don't have to worry about going to Germany. You can go ahead and get married. Sounded good to me. So when the Sarge found out about this, he said, what we're going to do is you're going to sign out from Mr. King at training aids and you're going to come over and work for me and I'll get you set up over there doing that. So that's what we did. So I've been a cheerful adieu to Mr. King and all the, you know, the nice people. He was so nice to me there. I hated to, to deceive him like that, but I also wanted to get married. So I just walked over the other side of the post and started working for training aides. I mean, for uh, the uh, uh, special services. Now working for special services, Bill settled into his new assignment. And John Gilmore set me up teaching photography, teaching painting. We had our own painting studio with all these easels, all the uh, big and larges and stuff in the dark. And we had all this, the government paid for it. Uh, hired my wife, Rebecca, as the secretary. She ran the, uh, the admin she administrated the duties of the uh, craft shop. Uh, there was a gallery in front of it where they hung my paintings. Being in the Army didn't stop Bill from pursuing his love of making movies. We also made a lot of movies while I was in the Army. Um, and um, one that we made, um, it was called The Pod. And it was, it was about a six foot long slug, I guess you'd call it. Like if you can imagine a snail without the uh, shell on the back. And we did another movie called The Pallid Mask, which is based on uh, a series of short stories in a book of, uh, called The King in Yellow by Robert W. Chambers. I was fascinated by that uh, book in that um, it was a series of short stories about a book, a fictional book called The King in Yellow. And if anybody ever read the book, The King in Yellow, it drove them insane. So making a movie about people reading this book and going insane fit in with my uh, way of making movies and the Fellini-esque surreal nature of it. Uh, and so we had a lot, of, a lot of fun with that. Bill, now comfortable in his role at Special Services, found himself once again being transferred to another assignment. I had been transferred out of headquarters company to a automotive mechanic company because they had to have a certain number of people under this auspices. Even though I wasn't working in the motor pool, I was there, but I was there on their books only. I went to roll call once a month or I had to be there at five o'clock in the morning. They called my name, I said, here, and that was it. Then I went back. That was the only time I wore a uniform was for that hour that I did roll call once a month. I wore civilian clothes. I taught photography, I taught painting. We made movies, John Gilmore and I made movies together. And that ultimately led to the creation of my publishing career. Toward the end of his time in the Army, Bill, looking to start a fanzine, convinced his bosses to buy a printing press and started what would become Paragon Publications. So uh, I had uh, learned about fanzines by answering ads in the back of uh, uh, Marvel Comics and ordered some fanzines. And I learned that there was a place you could market your cartoons and comic strips other than through Marvel and DC, which were pretty much the only publishing company. So I decided I would uh, do my own uh, print my own publications. So literally the last week or so I had in the army before I, I went out, I, uh, John asked me what we wanted to spend the, all this money we had left over on. First words out of my mouth were printing press. So we drove into Savannah and we bought a, 
we went to the AB Dick company. We bought a printing press. We, we bought the, the camera to shoot the negatives, the processing stuff, all the, the ink and the paper and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I had uh, at training aids under Mr. King, I had drawn this. Uh, what if the Golden Age Captain Marvel had been brought back in Marvel comics of today? You know, where Stanley was creating Peter Parker, a guy who had a lot of personal problems. What personal problems would Captain Marvel have? So I had this story and I uh, put that together with some other stuff and put together a 40 page magazine. And the very last days I was in the army, we printed this thing on this printing press. And that was the start of Paragon Publications. During a trip to Georgia, Bill drew inspiration for his publishing company. Why was it called Paragon? Because Rebecca and I on a weekend, we were out in the Georgia countryside, stopped at a restaurant that was called Paragon. Georgia is redneck as you can get. And this was very unusual. The decor of the place was, was kind of almost psychedelic. And they had very nice placemats and the logo on the placemat was the word Paragon because it was the Paragon restaurant. So I stole the placemat and remembering what Bill Colleen had taught me, I cut that out and pasted that up as the name of my fancy. It was Paragon Golden Age Greats. And that was my, you know, on the, the name of my company and the, the, the first publication that I did. His time in the Army concluded, Bill found himself looking for work in the civilian world. Okay, good to his word. Once I got out of the Army, uh, I was hired by Bill Parenti and I, I did a, a few stories for uh, Creepy and Eerie magazine, which gave me my in to uh, the professional world of comics. And I, it was, it was good, um, but I, I, I was used to doing what I wrote, you know, and uh, here I had to draw what somebody else wrote and I didn't like that as much because I was not that disciplined an artist. And um, anyways, also I went to work for a film production company, another strange luck thing. Uh, I'm out of work, uh, I have a wife and um, you know, what are we gonna do for a living? And a guy comes to the house to sell me an insurance policy and I tell him my sad story, he says, hey, I know this guy that's starting a film production company down on Curran Drive in Orlando. And through that, I got a job and I was working there as an illustrator. While trying to have kids, Bill and his wife, Rebecca, discovered that adoption would be the best option for them. Um, we tried to have children and couldn't. We went to a doctor and they gave us the tests and it was determined that neither one of us could uh, produce a, uh, a child. We were living in uh, Castleberry in central florida near orlando at the time and we got up with an adoption agency uh i don't i think i was working for a film production company at the time or maybe i was unemployed rebecca had a really crappy job low paying job in south orlando we didn't have much money so uh i don't know if it cost money to adopt or not but anyways when we, when we went over to, to look at the baby that they, they decided this would be a good match for us we drove over to daytona we put blankets in a cardboard box, okay? Put that in the back seat, and we go in, and you know, I was all like, well, I don't know if I want any kids, you know, because it's gonna really change our life and everything. And then I saw the baby and went, oh, we're taking this home, okay? So, it, and it did, it changed everything. Anyways, we took her home in this cardboard box, and uh, we tell Laura this now, that's my daughter, Laura. Um, I named her Laura because I said, uh, I was a really big Vincent Price fan, and I said, we're going to have to name our child after a character in a Vincent Price movie. And Rebecca said no to Lygia, so we went for Laura, because <laughs> he made Laura with Danny Andrews and Gene Tierney in, in the late 40s, or early 40s. So she became Laura, and um, we put Laura in the cardboard box, stopped at McDonald's on the way back, and had, <laughs> had lunch, and then home we went. With little opportunity in the Orlando area, Rebecca got a job working for Florida State University, prompting them to move back to Tallahassee. At that point in time, my wife had got a really crappy job working for a construction outfit in South Orlando. So we were living in Castleberry and she was driving this enormous distance every day on I-4, which is a nightmare. Uh, so uh, she contacted, uh, people she knew at Florida State to see if there was a, a teaching position there. And uh, the uh, faculty, she was a, a graduate, she had a master's degree from Florida State 
in interior design, which is designing houses and uh, living rooms and things of that nature. And uh, the woman who, uh, Dr. Wheel, who was in charge of that department was thrilled to hear from her and sort of hired her on the spot. And so we knew if we went to Tallahassee that my wife would have a job and she was a, an associate professor in that school. And she also uh, manipulated uh, her political ties to get me a job working as an illustrator at the uh, media center there, where I also made films and we did slideshows and did things for the president of the university. While in Tallahassee, Bill began to work on his next film, Bloodsuckers from Outer Space. While we were in Tallahassee, uh, we uh, again started making, we started making a movie called Bloodsuckers from Outer Space. I had become a fan of the old movie serials, and this was like taking my comic book character, The Shade and the girl from LSD, and doing what Republic Studios would have done with them when they adapted Captain Marvel in the 40s. In other words, just take the name and the costume and throw everything out the window. And we couldn't do flying scenes and all that because I'm, I'm shooting in 60 millimeters sound. So we just did practical effects. And I had these guys that were with the Florida State uh, Flying Circus who were acrobats. And uh, they did crazy stuff. We, we shot at a warehouse location. Again, guerrilla filmmaking, we didn't get anybody's permission to do this. So we just went down there and shot. It was a warehouse by the train depot. And uh, uh, the guys would be running away and the shade would be running up on this platform at the uh, warehouse. And when they get to the end of the platform, he'd dive off and dive into these guys and they'd go into a rough and tumble fight. Well, we didn't have any pads or we didn't have any knee guards or anything. So, I mean, these guys just did it. And anything I'd ask them to do, they did. And then we got some really amazing footage of this. And it was, it was a great experience. While working on art for a film company, Bill received an interesting postcard from Marvel Comics, asking him to join their team. Also, while I was in Tallahassee, I got a letter from uh, a postcard from uh, Roy Thomas at Marvel Comics. He said, Bill, don't you think it's time you started working as an inker for Marvel Comics? And the day I got that, uh, I had been working freelance for this, the guy I had worked with before in the film production company. He had given me lots of films to do the artwork for and we were doing it through the mail. At this time, I had a, a large family room and I had all these cells, we call them art cells, like animation cells, where I would draw a black outline on one side and paint it in on the backside in acrylics. I had like 50 or 60 of these in the room drying when I get this post postcard from Roy. So I'm in the, in the middle of the, this big project. So even though it sounds like a thing that would be at, at the top of anybody's bucket list, I was so busy, it was two weeks before I even responded to Roy about it. And, uh, but he did hire me and I did ink some stuff in 1978 uh, for Marvel Comics. I can't say that it was an enjoyable experience. Um, I would have much rather have been working in the 60s where I could ink Jack Kirby or, uh, you know, Dick Ayers or any of those guys that were no longer working with the company in the late 70s. Bill took the gig with Marvel working on the What If comic book series. Roy had me uh, do books, obviously, under his auspices. And I, I did some issues of What If, which were like a double-sized book. So comics were only 17 pages back then, So, but the What Ifs were like 33 pages. So that was, that was a, a good assignment to do that. While working for Marvel, Bill continued working on his fanzine. I also was doing my fanzines at that time. I, I had The first thing I did when I got out of the Army was also start up the fanzine. And uh, I, I had those, we, we printed maybe 500 copies of that one with Captain Marvel when I was in the Army. And I sent this to uh, a guy I knew, Marty Grime, who did other, another fanzine. He lived up in Boston. And he said, oh, you shouldn't release this because you'll get sued by Fawcett Publications because they didn't do comics anymore, but they're still in business and uh, they own the rights to Captain Marvel, we assume. And so probably you shouldn't do this. So I, I threw all those, I had to throw them in the trash and I only kept a couple of copies of that. And uh, But I converted uh, Captain Marvel to Captain Paragon and created a character, Captain Paragon, which was the, the main uh, hero in my Paragon publications line. So I did Captain Paragon stories and I did Paragon Illustrated and 
Paragon Presents and various titles with Paragon in, and I did Captain Paragon in his own book. And whereas other fanzine publishers, they did like one title and they did different subjects within the title. I wanted to be more like Marvel Comics where I had a whole bunch of different titles. And I, as far as I know, I was the only guy that did that. Eventually, Bill made his way back to Orlando and began doing artwork for a film company. I moved back to, to Winter Park and I worked for the guy who was sending me all this artwork to do through the mail. And uh, we, were, we were making films at a clip. We were doing like 200 films a year. It was incredible. Uh, so he had a, a real system going for doing things on the cheap and, and very fast. Uh, and I, again, I, I got to work on my stuff because we usually didn't start till afternoon on that as well. So in the morning I could do the Paragon stuff and then I, I shot for his stuff. He didn't care what I did as long as I, I got all the photography done and all the artwork done. And I got to hire other guys like, did you ever hear of Jerry Ordway? Okay, well, I, I hired Jerry and John Beatty and, and a couple other guys, Steve Vance and Tallahassee, to help me get all the artwork done. Because uh, we, like, we were doing 200 films a year and there were like 40 pieces of artwork in every film we did. So that's a lot of art. Uh, and it might be something as simple as just press type on a cell or it might be a, an illustration. So uh, I, I did that from 80, 78 into October of 82 when for political reasons, even though the company was, was making a good profit, they uh, had to get rid of the guy who was over us in the head office up in North Carolina. And they had to close down the filmmaking end of it. So I was told uh, literally days before that I was out of a job and I was given, I think, two weeks salary above that. <laughs> With the fanzine doing extremely well, it was suggested to Bill that he take the next step in his publishing career. Fortunately, the fanzines are doing very well. The fanzines were doing so well that uh, we were selling. Uh, okay, let me say this. One fanzine I printed, I thought I was being selfish, so I should do something for my family. So I had a swimming pool put in, in the backyard for my family, out of the money I made from just one fanzine. There was no distribution. Everything was sold piecemeal, one at a time through the mails. And I, I was selling in the thousands of these things. So uh, uh, I was also doing these while I was in Tallahassee and brought it back down here to Florida and uh, to Central Florida and, and continued that. And one of the printers that I was going to said, why don't you do a real comic book in color instead of these black and white fanzine things? With the idea to turn his fanzines into actual comic books, Bill started AC Comics. I started uh, AC Comics in October 82, and uh, we started actually producing the, the books by January 83. With the printing press lined up, Bill got to work releasing the first issue of AmeriComics. We would go and observe the printing and all that, and uh, a lot of times I, when it would change to a printer in Sanford, the, the Sanford Herald uh, printed my comics for several years, and I would just load my car up with the books and drive them back here to this office and uh, where we would uh, assemble them, put them together ourselves at that point. Uh, so um, it also at that time, the independent comics had just started and uh, people who did those were aware of my Paragon stuff and, and David Scroggy, who was doing Pacific Comics, which was the very first independent comic company, he said, Bill, why don't you, why don't you do that? And so I put that, those two things together, the local printer and uh, the invitation from Scroggy, and I, I jumped into it and we did uh, initially AmeriComics, which we, I hated the name AmeriComics, so I changed it to AC Comics as soon as I could. The first issues of the book were released with great success. Okay, the first comics AC Comics published was a leftover from the Paragon. I had done a, a book called Fun Comics, and I had done three issues through Paragon. So I just took that material and we colored it and put that out as AC Comics' first book, which is Fun Comics number four. And that had a Pat Broderick cover, and that, that was the first one, and it sold something like $28,000 copies. Now running his own comic publishing company, Bill had to deal with the stress of being the only employee. 
I was running AC Comics single-handed. I was doing everything myself, and I was really scrambling to get material together. And I, for the first time in my life, I was faced with having to put out more than one book at a time and on a monthly basis. I had to come out with two or three or four books a month. So I was scrambling, what do I do, what do I do? Well, I need a cover for this. When you go through Diamond or the distributors, you have to put your cover and your synopsis of the book out four months before the book comes out. And so this was the case back then. I had to have stuff that didn't even exist. I had to send them stuff and then I had to make it exist by the time my four months was up. That was the situation I was in. Still running AC by himself, all of his hard work was starting to pay off as an independent publisher. And we met with uh, amazing success right out of the gate. Uh, and what killed that for everybody was uh, Marvel and DC. Um, there were comic book stores throughout the country uh, at that time, but Marvel and DC could not sell to the comic book stores. So that was kind of a conundrum there where you had a, a store selling comic books, mostly back issues, but they couldn't handle the new stuff. So the independent market meant that now they would have new stuff and they, they would have product for the stores. Uh, and of course, Marvel and DC weren't gonna do this because it was an expensive process. And um, they wanted to see whether we were going to sink or swim before they got into it. So we were going full tilt and we're, we're being very successful. And a lot of other uh, independent publishers sprung up. I, I, AC Comics is one of the first five independent publishers and is the only of the five that still exist today. And literally hundreds of independent publishers have gone and come and gone since 1982. In order to make ends meet and keep AC going, Bill had to cut some deals with the printers. Um, I'm not a businessman. I have no business sense whatsoever. Um, it, it was all set up on credit. Um, you pay your rent every month on 30 days, so the world is set up to work on a 30-day cycle. So uh, when you send a book, to the distributor, you are paid by that distributor within 30 days. So I made the pitch to the printer that I, I can't pay you now, but I can pay you in 30 days. And my credit was good, so uh, we lined it up like that. So I, I never really, uh, I, like I said, I, I was working in film production and, and suddenly that uh, company went out of business and I, I had a two weeks salary to live on and I had to come up with something. So. We, we did this and I, I incorporated the material that I had at Paragon and turned it into a color process to do the, 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 the color comic. And I did it all on credit to this day. I've never invested any money into anything. We've been running for over 35 years on the basis of 30 days credit. While still working solo, Bill was introduced to someone who would become an influential figure in AC Comics. Between January 83 and 1990, I did it all myself. Mark Heike uh, lived up north and uh, he corresponded with me because I did uh, the Paragon um, of Girl from LSD and Phantom Lady, uh, good girl art stuff and he, he drew good girls and so he was sending me samples and he, he did some work for me uh, through the fanzines. Mark Heike co-created Force with Bill but was forced to drop out shortly thereafter. Eventually, um, um, after we created Femforce and all that, he, he co-created Femforce with me. Uh, I wrote the story and created the characters and uh, Mark penciled the first issue and I inked it. And we were, we were going on like that until he had some family problems and he had to drop out. Finally, Mark made the decision to move to Florida and join AC Comics full-time. By 1990, uh, he had made up his mind that he would move to Florida and join me in, in AC Comics. And so uh, he did, he came down and he was uh, initially uh, uh, rented a room from Rick Levins who was living in Chuliota. Mark ran the front office and I was in the back and he was kind of the guy that answered the phone and he was a buffer to keep people from bugging me. Because as you can imagine, it, we worked 24-7 pretty much uh, every day of the year uh, to put out the books. We we worked all weekends and we worked into the night because 
it's a tremendous amount of work and uh, there was only really two guys plus the artist the artist they did the drawings okay but mark and i we did the physical labor of putting the book together eventually dc and marvel were able to get new product into comic book specialty stores uh anyways eventually marvel and dc did go into it and they they did a special print run only for the comic book shop and so now the comic book shop had not only product they could move, but they had popular product that they could move. They had Spider-Man and Batman and Superman. So that kind of put the kibosh on the independent stuff. And uh, there was there was a big crash uh, in 84, 85. Uh, so we had like almost one good year and then the whole thing crashed. That's when everybody went into the black and white comics because it was cheaper and uh, you could survive. And how, how AC Comics survived for now 35 years I guess just because Mark Heike and I are crazy and uh, we don't want to become accountants, right? You know, so. While initially focused on certain books, Bill soon discovered that all the titles he created were marketable. I have a lot of number ones. If you don't go beyond number one, that means it didn't sell enough to go to a number two. And I hate this when people interview me. They say, why did you stop Captain Paragon after number four? Well, hell, if it was successful, I'd be doing it now. You know, I mean. Uh, so anyways, um, there are, I know we have cataloged 130 different titles of AC Comics, and it's probably upwards of 150 or more now. Uh, it's only been in recent years that we've settled into a, a set number of books that we uh, uh, have carried on to go into the high number range. Bill, knowing that a certain number of copies had to be sold in order to keep his comic enterprise afloat, had to find creative ways to keep his characters relevant and updated. We um, tried to make a go of it with uh, Femforce, and that has remained our most popular title for all these years. But every time we do a spinoff, try to put Nightville in her own book or she can in her own book, that doesn't fly. And we can't figure that out. Also with the movies, when I make a Night Vale movie, you think the people that would buy the comic book would buy the movie, but they don't. And I have never yet to figure that out. But um, it's always uh, like uh, I've bitten them off now, but uh, the history of AC Comics is one of hanging by your fingernails for 30 years, for over three decades. So uh, you have to uh, sell a certain number of copies in order to remain with uh, Diamond Distribution, and we managed to do that uh, barely. And uh, it, it's always, you know, you never know when it's, it's going to end, and I, I, I'm amazed. I mean, uh, we have to make all the characters immortal. When we started this, I mean, I, I remember when we hit number 20 on Film Force. Oh, wow, my God, I've made it to number 20. Well, now they've been around for 30 years, and I mean, we've got to have them immortal, and they're like, um, well, we actually killed off Joan Wayne because she was supposedly from World War II. And we got to the point where in her alter ego, she would be 90 something years old. So we had to have her die. And then she just became Miss Victory all the time. So she was an, an immortal from that point on. But these are things I never thought about when I started the company that we'd have any sort of success with it. During his time with Marvel, Bill came up with an exciting new concept that got shot down but eventually gave birth to his greatest seller. Okay, Film Force. When I was working at uh, Marvel and I did a, a book for Roy, uh, what if, what if the Avengers were formed in the 1950s? And this was fun for me because it had characters in the book that I got to, to ink that were characters I actually bought in the 50s that no longer existed, like Marvel Boy and uh, Janet of the Jungle and this kind of stuff. So anyways, uh, he, he had in the book, he had Venus from the 50s, uh, Jen of the Jungle, uh, Namora, which was uh, Namor's uh, cousin. And uh, I, I approached Roy, I said, hey, what do you think about this? Why don't you do a book that's all female characters? You could put uh, a blonde phantom and uh, Namora and uh, take one or two of the jungle girls and Venus and uh, they had a, a Miss America. They had uh, not very many, but they had a couple of Marvel female characters uh, in the in the 40s and uh, put them together as a, as a as an all female team, and he said, "Nah, that wouldn't work." He said, "Female characters just they don't sell. That's why we don't do very many female character books." And no, nah, a, a team of females wouldn't work. So okay, time goes. I'm no longer with Marvel Comics, and I'm 
finding I'm really enjoyed drawing uh, beautiful women and the, the the sexy gal aspect of it and most all of my characters are that so uh, I, I guess it was in Femzine number one I did a story uh, I worked with Willie Blyberg an artist on that where uh, I formed a group called uh, Fem Force One F E M M E one word force one the numeral one or the all girl squad and I, I teamed up Phantom Lady Sin Blonde Bomber and <laughs> there was another one uh, there was four of them anyways uh, and that kind of caught on with Fem Force as his best-selling title Bill recounts how the first issue came to be um, when uh, when we went from Paragon to AC Comics, I went more mainstream with the subject matter. In other words, I went away from the, the, the sexy, busty girl stuff to what would be traditionally in comics at that time in 1982. Okay, now everything goes in comics today. I mean, comics are much more risque and uh, lewd than anything I would have ever have considered it at any point in my life. So, uh, we start off AC Comics with Captain Paragon and the superhero stuff and all that. And we got to the point where uh, uh, the market had, had died down in, in 1984. And I was struggling for content. And I had material left over from the Paragon day. So we put out Femforce as a special. And uh, to our surprise, it sold better than the other stuff that we were doing. So then we uh, started, I guess, in 1985 with that as, as a, a main title. And all the other superhero guys who lost their own books, they became uh, support characters in the Femforce title. With an established publishing company, Bill was able to attract other artists to work on his books. Some of those have gone on to expand their careers and gain name recognition. A lot of guys that went on to have good careers uh, worked with uh, AC Comics or got their, their first gig at AC Comics, like Eric Larson's probably the most notable of them. But uh, I started uh, AC Comics with Jimmy Sanders, a little guy, I think he was just in high school, or just out of high school in Jacksonville. At the very beginning, he, he drew uh, the story that I inked for the what would be fun comics number four, the Captain Paragon story. And he went on to have a good career with uh, Marvel. And uh, of course, John Beatty, he, he was with me at age 17 and went on to do uh, Secret Wars, Captain America and uh, um, the Nom. Uh, the guys I got from Charlton, uh, Rick Levins, he, he had pro probably the longest stint on Captain America of any artist that ever worked on the feature. Um, Mark Probst and John Dell, they're still working in the industry. Rick, unfortunately, passed away a few years ago. Um, a lot of guys I knew or had access to that did covers like uh, um, Perez and um, um, Pat Broderick, uh, Jerry Ordway, who I'd worked with in the fanzine stuff and for the film company. He and Mike Mocklin, they both went on uh, working with Roy Thomas at DC on the Justice Society revivals. Uh, Mike's not doing anything anymore that I'm aware of, but of course Jerry's had a stellar career. And I, I think he ranks as one of the, the best artists in the whole history of comics. He's, he's just a tremendous, tremendous talent. And he did star films for me even back in the Paragon days. Perez, uh, he did the cover to AmeriComics uh, number one. And originally I was going to use a, a Steranko cover for that that, that that Jim had done for me for one of my Paragon books. Over time, sales went down and Bill got the call he was dreading. There came a point when we got the, the, uh, the Executioner's Axe call from Diamond that uh, they were going to kick us off because we weren't selling enough. And... Uh, well, we talked with, I, I talked on the phone with um, with uh, Bill Shanus, and he's another guy that goes all the way back to the fanzine days. And so he's he knows our history and he felt really bad. I could see, hear it in his voice that he was given the ax to the longest running independent comic company that was in existence at that time. And uh, he made the suggestion that maybe we should uh, concentrate on doing high price books 
In other words, we know we weren't going to sell a lot of copies, but if we had a big dollar sign on it, we would make the diamond minimum. That's why we came up with the idea of doing a $10 Femme Force and a $30 Mena Mystery in Crypto Horror. I mean, I never would have thought of doing that. But here we had the blessing of diamond, and that's what they suggested that we do. And I never in a million years would have thought that that would have succeeded, but, but we've been doing this for many years. Even so, much to Bill's surprise, the characters he has created have withstood the test of time. I, I was amazed that, it, that we were succeeding and it was going as long as it did. And I, I, I could see that I had something that was lasting. You know, these characters weren't a, a flash in the pan. I've seen so many of these other companies come and go and the characters forgotten about, you know, they had a, a year's existence or two years and then they're gone. But these characters uh, are, are still existing and have gone on long, you know, uh, after, after I, I would have thought we would have uh, fallen by the wayside. So uh, that was unusual, and uh, that's sort of my legacy, that I, uh, I'll i be dead and gone, but hopefully maybe the Night Bill and these other characters will continue on after I'm gone. And it, it, it seems to be we're getting a lot of new people in doing it that like the characters, and so it could perpetuate after that, I hope. I hope. Eventually, Bill would retire from AC Comics and turn the day-to-day -day operations over to Mark. Even though officially retired, Bill continues to work for the company he built. Even though I'm retired, uh, I have uh, made a commitment to uh, Mark Heike at AC to do the next three issues of Femforce. Femforce is going back to color. And so I'm writing and inking and doing some penciling, but lettering and coloring three issues of Femforce. And uh, so here I've, I've, I've overcommitted again, and, uh, but I'm in, it's a challenge. There were certain things that needed to be done in these stories because going to color, we're going to a bigger audience and we're going to hit people that have never read the book before. So I have to work into the story who the characters are and, and demonstrate what their personalities are so that new readers can get in, in three issues an understanding of, of, of what, you know, what the characters are and decide if they want to continue to, to read the book. So we're hoping that, that it will be successful, but you know, you never know. Also in retirement, Bill finds time to pursue his other love, filmmaking. I didn't have time to do the movies and the comics. Uh, so now that I'm retired from AC Comics, I spend my time doing this and also uh, working the movies that I did uh, in the eight millimeter days, like House at the End of the World, I really want to put that out on digital and, and you know, finally finish those movies I started 50 years ago. <laughs> Free from the handling of the day-to-day -day operations for AC, Bill was able to go back and finish the movie he had started years prior. I, I took the, the three Nyoka chapters that John and I uh, did, they were done as single standing serial episodes and we started off with like chapter five we did chapter five six and seven or whatever, something like that like in the middle so we never had a beginning and we never had an ending so i i went back and uh made a feature out of that i, I put the three chapters together and, and shot 30 minutes of a new movie and called it nyoka and the lost amulet of voltura and put all the elements in it like who is the masked villain and established characters that the audience had to guess who was the, the mass villain really and that kind of stuff. And we had a lot of fun with that. Looking back at one of his prior films, Bill decided to remake it using modern technology. Then I, um, I also decided to remake one of my early movies, which was The Amazing Colossal Woman. And um, that was done on such primitive equipment and it was primitive software that it, it was such an embarrassment to me. So I used all the, the uh, green screen footage I had of the leading lady who we composited in to make her the giant woman and shot a lot of new footage, um, mostly up in the land and added a lot of new characters to flesh out the story. And we took a, a 25 minute movie and made it a 61 minute movie. And we had a lot of fun with that. And I, I got to meet a lot of new people working on that. And Bill, on a roll with his filmmaking, decided to make a movie that relied less on special effects. Then after that, I did um, Shadow Slayer, which I purposely designed as a vehicle for Brenna Berry, who worked years before on The Amazing Colossal Woman. 
and also as a movie that had very limited special effects because I Ghost of Gargana is taking forever to be finished because of the extensive every scene in the movie is a special effect and if you worked in an editing program you know that you have timelines and when you put a special effect you put a timeline on top of that and a timeline on top of that well in the giant woman thing we might have as many as nine timelines with all these things composited in one scene this is very time consuming the scene might last for 10 seconds but it might take you a week to do it you know so shadow slayer was something i wanted to do where i i thought i could put more time into the camera work and not be so rushed in filming it. And it was 100% a Bill Black thing. I wrote it and I directed it. And um, it was more the kind of a movie I wanted to do. It was, had nothing to do with comic books. It was just a straight out uh, horror movie, but not a slasher type movie. But I was very pleased with the way that turned out. Naturally, being in the comic and film business, Bill has attracted some fans over the years. The fans of his work are something that he embraces. They mean quite a lot. Uh, I've been uh, reading uh, the, the book on uh, James Warren, who did the creepy and eerie and famous monsters. And um, he, uh, he hated fans. He said, I don't want fans, I want readers, because it was all in the numbers, how many books you're, you're going to sell. Uh, but it's a, it's a different story today, uh, because the whole the industry is different. No one has this, the kind of circulation. Uh, that they have now, and you know, uh, I guess some of the DC and Marvel books have a circulation of what the fanzines were back in the 70s, you know. So, uh, uh your bread and butter is the fans, and uh, I never thought of, I was like we're talking about Bill Everett, I was a fan of Bill Everett, I was a fan of Sid Shores and Neil Adams and Strank and all these guys, and Monty Hill and Roy Rogers and Charles Sterrett, uh, and I could see how. Paying attention to them in the later years of their life meant a lot to them. And now I'm experiencing the, the same thing now. Uh, guys who uh, bought my comics back in the, the 80s when they were kids, you know, now have uh, grown up and had a family and had a job and now they have disposable income and now they're going back and collecting stuff and they're, uh, you know, looking at my old fanzines and stuff like that. So, and, uh, I've become, you know, friends, uh, with uh, a lot of fans and, uh, uh, enjoy it. I have a really good relationship with, with uh, like a half dozen uh, fans, uh, Eric Matthews and Mark Holmes and, and Jay Williams and uh, Cliff uh, Weichel, who has a, a Cliff's Books in the Land, Florida. Uh, all these guys, uh, they're very supportive of me and uh, I, I really appreciate it. Bill, now retired, can look back with fondness on his creations and the life that he has made for himself. Starting AC Comics, that, that was that was a challenge, and that that of course is my legacy. That uh, and then creating Fem Force, I think, is the most important achievement of my life. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, one of your questions was, did you think it would last this long? No. With his working days behind him, he was free to create his art, be it movies or drawing, on his own schedule, a luxury that he most certainly enjoys. I've never been happier than when I'm doing my own thing. And uh, uh, like the Frank Sinatra song, I, I got to do my life and I did it my way. And uh, in fact, if I brought the lyrics to that song and that can be my testament, I'll tell you this. Only one line in that whole song that I would change and otherwise otherwise you could carbon copy it as, as you know, my a testimony to my life. Um, Working at Marvel was not a thrill. I would have hated to have drawn Spider-Man, who would want to ink all those buildings and the spider web and all that, right? But, uh, and you know, I, I was a fan of the Fantastic Four. I would have loved, uh, killed to, to ink Jack Kirby on the Fantastic Four. That would have been a highlight of my life. But uh, I think I'm far better off having done my own thing in creating my own comics. Uh, so I'm glad I did what I did. Uh, we it never made it big, but I got to do what I wanted to do, and I did it when I wanted to do it. And it's even better now that I'm retired because I don't have to face the monthly uh, deadline. At the end of the day, 
Bill is an artist at heart and loves to create. I'm really enjoying getting back into drawing and uh, experimenting and uh, stopping when I want to stop. And uh, with my family, I get interrupted every hour anyways. And with my heart problem, I fall asleep every hour anyways. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I do what I want to do and I do when I want to do it and I can stop and start whenever I want to do it. And I, I, I have created a line of characters that I, I really have infused with what I believe is a life of their own. And they have their own personality and their own characteristics. And so it's, it's easy to write them. And it's uh, like, I know them like they're my own daughters and sons and all that. And so I enjoy being with them when I'm drawing them and when I'm writing them, it's, it's fun and it's a challenge. It's still a challenge. I Whether it be through his art filmmaking, or just his personality. Bill brings joy to the people he reaches, and with a new movie in the can, he doesn't show any signs of slowing down. I love doing movies, and I grew up on, I grew up on comics and movies starting when I was six years old. There wasn't a weekend in my life up until I got married that I didn't go to the movies on the weekend. And I bought every comic book I could get my hands on if it was a superhero or somebody had a mask. People think I like Westerns. Well, I like Westerns if it's the Lone Ranger or uh, Black Rider, Drago, kid, somebody that's wearing a mask, then I like that. Uh, but I, yeah, I have become a big Western fan. Uh, but I'm, I'm excited by all this and I, I enjoy doing this. And now that I'm in retirement, I don't have to do it for a living. And that is like, cutting the bonds that bind you. It, it's just, you're free to float and do whatever you want to do because I don't have to do it for the money. I, I am no kind of a businessman, but yet for whatever reason, I ended up okay. I, I have uh, systems in place that my family is taken care of. If I die tomorrow, they will be well off, okay? Uh, and that's good. So this is a type of freedom that I can really enjoy. Bill continues to make movies, comics, and the time to go out to conventions and meet his fans. When you're a creator, you have this urge, you just want to do it all the time. If you have the ability, and, and it doesn't matter whether anybody thinks you're any good or not, or whether you do have the ability, you, you have to do it. You have to create. I mean, there are a lot of terrible artists who became really big, like Grandma Moses. So you guys wouldn't know who that is, but this old lady who painted so badly that it was good. And <laughs> she became very wealthy doing the, the worst garbage you could imagine. But uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's just something I'm compelled to do. And uh, I, I will continue to do it till I drop. And uh, I know... Uh, it's it's my way and I'm that's what I got to do and I'm I'm sticking to it. Okay. Not bad for a guy who's had a little help from some strange luck.